Welcome to another in our series of Cody Connects webinars. This is After Monsignor Cody, the St. of X Extension Department, 1953 to 2000. Our presenter is Peter Ludlow. An expert on the Antigonish movement, Dr. Peter Ludlow is an adjunct professor of Catholic Studies at St. Francis Xavier University and president of the Canadian Catholic Historical Association. His first book, The Canny Scot, Archbishop James Morrison of Antigonish, was published by McGill Queen's University Press in 2015. He has recently completed a history of the St. of X Extension Department entitled Confronting History, the St. of X Extension Department 1960 to 2018. Now, while many have heard of the work of the celebrated Monsignor Moses M. Cody and the St. Francis Xavier University Extension Department, which has become known globally as the Antigonish Movement, what happened to the Extension Department after Cody's retirement in 1952? In this webinar, Dr. Peter Ludlow will explore the people, projects, and challenges of the fabled Extension Department from 1953 until 2000. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Peter Ludlow. Welcome, Peter. Great. Thank you very much. It's, <clears throat> it's wonderful to be here, and this is a new format for me, so I'm very excited about it, and I'm very thankful that uh, the Cody webinar has, uh, has included me in, in uh, this process. It's, it's exciting. Um, as you can see on the screen, the title of, of tonight's talk is After Monsignor Cody, the Son of X Extension Department 1953 to 2000. Um, just a little background before I get going. This last summer, I wrote a short history of the Son of X Extension Department from 1960 to 2018. It's commissioned, or it was commissioned in part, to celebrate the 90th anniversary of Extension's founding. Now, I must confess that when I began the project, like a lot of people, I tended to think of the Extension Department merely in terms really of 1928 to 1952. As a historian of the Antigonish movement, I was always immersed in the narrative of cooperatives and credit unions and in the personalities of people like Father James Tompkins, George Boyle, who a lot of people haven't heard of, unfortunately, Father Michael Gillis, and Mary Arnold, people like that, some of, the, some of the big names, if you will. Yet while writing the short book over some 10 weeks, <clears throat> so not a long time, I became very interested in Extension's important and very interesting history after 1952. It was, as we're going to talk about tonight, an organization that was really trapped by its history, if you will, and celebrated history and desperate, often desperate to find ways to serve the community while remaining true to those original principles that people like Monsignor Cody had established. Now, two things before I get going. First, I know that many of you listening tonight have had your own experiences with the Extension Department or know something about the organization. And we really only have time for sort of a basic summary tonight. Um, and when that happens, of course, some things often, or you know, things will get glossed over. And so in fine Cody fashion, I, I do look forward to the information exchange that we can have uh, when the hour is up. Um, and the second, and I, you know, as a social historian, it pains me to say that this is not exactly a social history. Um, it's not a social history presentation and because there's so much ground to cover that I stick pretty close to the directors. I do discuss a lot of the wider themes, but we stay pretty close to the directors. And so in the book, um, there's a lot more information about, about you know, the field workers and some of the people on the ground. Okay. Let's see, okay. I'll flip through. There we go. Um, I don't want to spend too much time. I'm having trouble here. Sorry, folks. Going to, there we go. I don't want to spend too much time on the early history of the Antigonish movement. But we have to discuss some of the basics, I think. Well, the Center of X Extension Department is created by the University's Board of Governors in 1928. It's extremely difficult, very difficult to pinpoint the birth of this economic, educational, and social awakening. Some historians point to the early agricultural work of priests like Monsignor Little Doc Hugh McPherson. Others, of course, point to the uh, more famous Father James J. Tompkins, who was deeply concerned that Senevex is not doing enough 
to address the local economy. At an educational conference held in London, England in 1912, the vice rector is very impressed with an international call for university extension work. And he becomes convinced that universities like Cenevex have to train and influence those local people who otherwise will never set foot on the Anaganish campus. And then of course, and this is important, all of this activity has to be seen through the prism of Roman Catholic intellectual life in this period. In influential encyclicals like Rerum Novarum of 1891 suggests that the church has to do more than offer the flock spiritual substance. Okay, it has to place itself between unfettered capitalism and radical ideologies that are percolating like communism. So in other words, Catholic leaders like Archbishop James Morrison, who you see on the far right, who is also the Chancellor of Senevex, remember you're both in this time, you're both Bishop of the Diocese of Antigonish and Chancellor of the University. They have a real stake in making the local economy work. One can't talk about the Antigonish movement without understanding the Catholic action, action of this period. So what are these people concerned about? There we go. Like today, when so many of our young people are leaving for Ontario and Alberta, so too after 1885 are the youth leaving for Ontario and New England. Okay, the causes of this generational problem are varied. But historians agree that by about 1890, when almost 100,000 people left the Maritimes, the exodus had taken on the characteristics of a mass migration. At one point, in fact, the out-migration from the Cape Breton countryside, for example, is so great that you see people writing um, in newspapers and, in, and, in, and in, in correspondence that young men and women are as scarce as hen's teeth. Now. The Catholic clergy, of course, who are in these parishes throughout eastern Nova Scotia, they recognize that they can't sustain this kind of rural depopulation. As the old farms are abandoned, so too is the culture. Okay, so too is the culture of many different communities. And so too is the faith. Something, something drastic has to be done. Now, the young people that aren't going off to Boston or Hartford, uh, they're being pulled into the burgeoning coal mines and the steel mill, steel mills um, in Sydney and Glace Bay. After the establishment of the Dominion Coal Company in 1893, Sydney leaps almost instantly from a peaceful old-fashioned country town, essentially, into one of the most important manufacturing centers in Canada. And soon after that, for those people who are from that area, you know that various towns and villages like Reserve Mines, Dominion, Bridgeport, they develop around the productive coal seam and the modern steel plant that's opened in 1900. Now, not only did people from Eastern Europe pour, uh, from Eastern Nova Scotia, excuse me, pour into the, into the coal fields, but young families also came from Newfoundland. They came from Eastern Europe. They come from Italy. The demographic growth that we see at this time certainly creates a Catholic renaissance of sorts. And what I mean by that is new parishes are constructed, schools, hospitals. But the social, the economic, the moral problems that are created by this rapid industrialization, you know, it scares the heck out of the clergy. And devastating strikes in 1909, and more infamous, infamously, the, the terrible coal mining strike of 1925, um, it convinces the clergy intellectuals at Senevex and elsewhere that the church has to do more than, they have to offer something more material than Sunday mass, okay? If they don't, the people are going to fall away from the faith. It's, it's that simple. So what are the basic, these are the basic problems. So in the short term, what are the solutions? It's important that you understand that the extension department is born out of a process, and I can't stress this enough. Okay, it's a collaborative effort. Now, one of the most famous of these individuals, of course, is the Marguerite native, Father James J. Tompkins. And I wanna point out here, because I'm probably gonna do it again during this talk, but I wanna point out that we, we often call this priest Father Jimmy. And like I say, I'll probably do it again because it's such a habit. But Father Tompkins hated being called Father Jimmy, and I have a I have a lot of letters um, 
and I'm going to hold one up if you want to. It's just to just to just to prove my point. But if you if you click on the right hand uh, corner of your screen, I'll hold it up. And this is a letter from that Monsignor Cody wrote to a friend in Michigan in 1949. And he writes in it, he says, uh, just to take a piece from it, he says, before anything else, I must clear up a false impression that some people have in the U.S. with regard to Dr. Tompkins' place in our movement. We have had several requests for details on the sensational, sensational find, as they thought, that Father J.J. Tompkins, Jimmy, as they called him, which, by the way, he hates, and I don't blame him. Um, so it's just something I like to say anytime I talk on the Antigonish movement that, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a major player um, in this history, and we should go back to just calling him Father James or Father Tompkins. But Father Tompkins should get a lot of praise uh, because although he's physically small, he's a really short guy and he's got a very squeaky, squeaky kind of voice, he's a, he was, according to his friends and his students, quote, awfully mighty, and you see this over and over again. Starting with the Antigonish Forward Movement in 1914, Tompkins tries to get local people to take a hard look at their economic circumstances, what they spend their money on, what kind of schools they're sending their, their children to, the state, of the, the state of the roads. And, you know, what he's basically saying is, look, you can't complain that your kids are going to Boston if you send all your money to a Toronto department store, you know, to, 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 to put it in basic terms. Now, in 1921, he published his knowledge for the people that you see on the left. It's a call to Son of X to embrace a new spirit of education. It's a powerful call. And he, wa he wants to do this through extension work. And then later in the winter of 1921, he holds the first people's school on, on the Antigonish campus. It's 57 unusual students. You see them there in the center from all sectors of the economy and none holding more than an eighth grade education. And they're welcomed into Son of X classrooms. And, and it's, it's a really, truly wonderful event. And, Tompkins doesn't teach a course. He gets a number of friends and academics at the school to do it, but he's fond of espousing his favorite formula. People times resources times education equals progress. Now, things are moving along seamlessly until the spring of 1922, when Father Tompkins gets into a major fight with his religious superiors over the future of Senevex. And in fact, he ends up transferred to the foggy coastal um, parish of Canso. Now, Tompkins is not transferred because of his progressive ideas or anything like that. Basically, he sent Canso because he advocates for a University of the Maritimes that would have put the place, the Son of X campus in Halifax. It would have moved the, the entire campus to Halifax, to the Northwest Arm, to be exact. And more specifically, when the diocese, when his boss, Bishop Morrison, turns down the scheme and says, no, Son of X is going to stay where it is, Tompkins begins supplying a young Angus L. MacDonald, who, of course, later became premier of Nova Scotia. He supplies him with material to attack his superior in the secular press, and so an example is made of him. But the important thing to remember here is that the cause of extension work, so passionately pursued by Father Tompkins, is now taken up by others. Okay, believe it or not, there were other important contributors besides Cody and Tompkins. Let's see if my slide comes up here. There they are. The educational conferences, which were started by Tompkins in 1918, are by 1924 now organized by priests like Father Michael Gillis. If you don't know about, about the guy on the left, a major player in the Antigonish movement. <clears throat> uh, other priests like uh, Father, later Bishop James Boyle of Harvard Bushy, very active in lobster canneries and lobster cooperatives. And everybody wants Senevex to begin some type of extension work. But due to a lack of finances and really a fear of failure, the university hesitates. Yet the priests have a plan. If Senevex is unwilling to lead Catholic social action in eastern Nova Scotia, then the college would have to be scared into action. When the Scottish Catholic Society of Nova Scotia, or excuse me, of Canada, a local society uh, with aims to preserve Scottish culture, music, the Gaelic language, um, and full of priests like Father Gillis, when they vote to raise $100,000 for some sort of extension program in the summer of 1928, well, Senevex is forced to organize, okay? Because in no way can 
Senevex, the only local Catholic college, allow another entity to become an educational leader in the region. Okay, so the demand is now palpable, and Senevex has to lead. So what is the extension department mandate? This is a very basic summary because we, we have to move on. But the message is simple. Okay, the local people have to work out their own economic salvation. And to do this, the people have to embrace study and group action. And this is the basic strategy, okay? A mass meeting is held to encourage participation. Then local study clubs are organized in kitchens, in parlors, in parish halls, and the club, these, these clubs liaise with the extension office who provide them with reading and study materials. And study they do. In Clydesdale, Anaganish County, for example, members sought scientific strategies for pasture improvement. Well, at McKinnon's Harbor, Victoria County, merely investigating potato seed varieties increased annual production by almost 75%, if you can believe it. Now, I've, I've always personally found it remarkable, and I know many others do too, that by the end of the 1930s, hundreds of people, most with minimal formal education, were empowered to study complex issues of agronomy and finance. And you know, if you think about it with the support of people like the American Credit Union advocate Roy, Ber Roy Bergengran, Extension helps to get the Credit Union Act passed through the Nova Scotia legislature. And on a frigid December evening in 1931, 19 families at Reserve Mines Cape Breton agreed to pool their lifetime savings, wait for it, of $4.75 to start a community bank. It's incredible, $4.75, and that's the bank in the picture there. Now, I want to say a quick word about women here, because as a historian, and certainly a historian with interest in the Catholic Church, I think it's very important. Thus far, it's been a lot of father this and Monsignor that. And of course, when talking about any Catholic social movement in this period, that's, that's natural. But clearly this is still a very patriarchal society. And so I think it's very important to remember that while women were obviously always active in their communities, and let's, let's be honest, I think they probably understood better than men the effect that a poor economy is gonna have on the entire family. But the Antigonish movement is a vehicle for women to take an active and public role in the community. It's important to remember that. Congregations like the Sisters of St. Martha had been the vanguard of Catholic social action, you know, providing hospital and welfare services since, well, since 1902. By 1926, the Marthas were in the countryside. They're teaching home economics and household management. Also, while the extension bulletin, and even at times the famous rural conferences, still promoted, as Rusty Neal has noted, a, quote, an, an idealized female-male dichotomy. Women religious like Sister Marie Michael, Mary Sarah, Mary Sarah McKinnon, and Sister uh, Mary Anselm, Irene Doyle, became public faces of the movement. And who can speak of this period without mentioning Mary Arnold, Kay Desjardins, Ida Delaney, Zeta Cameron, and Ellen Arsenal? Okay, so, so suffice to say then that by the early 1950s, the cooperatives and credit unions of the Antigonish movement, well, they're famous worldwide. On two occasions, the Pope sends a special commendation, and priests like Monsignor Cody and Father Tompkins truly are household names. Extension has a lot of clout, and through its radio station, CJ of X, the University of the Air, which began broadcasting in the spring of 1943, the message was modernized and taken into the kitchens and living rooms of the Maritimes. The personal celebrity of Monsignor Cody remained ubiquitous. And by 1950, the apostolic delegate, and that's the Pope's representative in Canada, he wants all Canadian seminarians to study the down-to-earth, quote, down-to-earth activities of the Antigonish movement. In fact, Cody's fame is so great that even the president of Senevex at that time was somewhat in awe of him. As one person recalled, President Hugh Summers was, quote, so much afraid of Dr. Cody, what he might say. Yet, and I think this is important, this popularity does create a problem, okay? Because as early as the 1940s, the work of extension is starting to become mythologized in books, newspaper articles, and even in Reader's Digest. 
And after Monsignor Cody's retirement from extension in 1952, the facts quickly start to give way to hyperbole. The successes are highlighted, okay, but the failures are downplayed. Some men and women are made saints, others are made sinners. But most crucial for extension, okay, and this is the thing to remember, is that Cody leaves the directorship as a kind of folk hero. And as we're going to see over the next few minutes, who can hope to replace a folk hero? Now, as we move past on this theme, as we move past Monsignor Cody, I want everyone to keep something in mind. In the 1980s, Dan McGinnis, then a young sociologist at Senevex, courageously argued that the Antigonish movement had become a live ghost. Okay, the live ghost is is the, the, the scariest of all Celtic myths because it goes everywhere. It went everywhere with field workers to remind them of extensions fabled past and their inability, if you will, to live up to the success of the early days. And as we shall see throughout this presentation, his analysis was spot on. So by early March 1952, then after 24 years at the helm, Monsignor Cody's ailing body forces him into retirement. He still had passion for the movement, but heart attacks and surgeries had drained him of energy. Now, it's important to note that Cody handpicks his successor. And the man he chooses is the head of Extension's field office in Sydney and former pastor at St. Anthony's Parish in Glace Bay, father later Monsignor Michael Joseph McKinnon. Now, this is a very good place to point out an important change, both in the, both in the clergy of the Diocese of Antigonish and in the faculty at Sen of X. Until the 1940s, most of the clergy, women religious, and college professors, who were mo mostly priests in that time, come from the rural areas of eastern Nova Scotia, so communities like Mabu, St. Andrews, Iona. Most, having grown up in an agricultural setting, they had little understanding of the labor movement and even at times were mistrustful of union rhetoric. Now that does not mean that they were opposed to unions or anything like that, or even working class ideals. It's just that they're very unfamiliar with them. But by the late 1940s and 1950s, most of the clergy like, like Monsignor McKinnon are now coming from the demographically larger colliery towns of Cape Breton. And having been reared among the union halls and wash houses, Okay, their idea of what might be considered radical has changed. Moreover, before entering Senevex, many of these young men spent time working in a coal mine or working in a steel mill, and so they have an intimate understanding of industrial life. And so the, the selection of the 46-year-old Monsignor Moses, uh, Michael McKinnon, excuse me, the quiet and shy son of a coal miner to replace Cody, is a reflection of this new reality. Now, everyone's delighted that Monsignor uh, McKinnon has been appointed director. Yet, while he certainly knows his business and was beloved in, in places like Whitney Pier, which sat next to the, to, the, to the Sydney Steel Mill, field workers soon recognize that replacing the charismatic Cody is going to be extremely difficult. Although McKinnon has a sharp intellect and he's a great friend of labor, he was more of an administrator than a philosopher. And as a speaker, he simply cannot match Cody's charisma. He was no talker, one colleague later complained. He also faced some formidable uh, philosophical and practical challenges, if you will. In the post-war maritime economy, larger companies with new technology continually challenged Cody's message that citizens could be masters of their own destiny. And the modern economy brought financing and administrative questions that were not easily answered. In the 1930s, it was easier to run labor schools, Monsignor Hugh Summers later recalled, but in the modern economy, as soon as you brought these labor leaders along, they started asking questions that extension couldn't answer. The challenging economic landscape, consumer cooperatives, for example, were increasingly challenged by Dominion Stores and Simpson Sears, and the loss of Cody, generated a sense that extension was starting to wane. So this is as early as the late 1950s, people are starting to get that feeling. More problematic, Bishop John R. MacDonald, Bishop of Antigonish and Chancellor of Sen of X, soon begins to grumble about the lack of progress. There were also a few administrative stumbles. 
The expenses for the fisheries grant, for example, had not been reported for two years, and there was a growing rift between Extension and the Provincial Department of Agriculture that threatened to cut off vital funding. It was soon clear that a change had to come. There will always be some question as to whether McKinnon was happy in the work he undertook, recalled one friend. There are those who feel that he left his heart in the parishes. Now, primarily to repair the relationship with provincial bureaucrats, in 1958, McKinnon is removed from extension and appointed executive vice president of Senevex, a new position. So while Cody had served 24 years at the helm, his hand-picked successor had lasted less than seven. For those used to extension having a free hand, it's an ominous development. I also want to note here um, that the removal of Monsignor McKinnon represents the last of the old extension pioneers. In 1952, Angus Bernard A.B. McDonald, Cody's original assistant, had died. Uh, he died in Ottawa. Father Tompkins in 1953. Monsignor Cody dies in the warm summer of 1959. A couple months later in October, Monsignor McKinnon follows him at, uh, in his early 50s. Um, a month after that, son of ex-chancellor and Bishop Jenner, Bishop Jenner McDonald also gives up the ghost, leaving the new director of extension without contacts and without experience. So in 1959, we have a new director, and I would wager that few of you have heard of him. His name is Father John Allen Gillis. He's raised in Inverness and he, he's ordained in 1937. Father Gillis had once served as a curate at Reserve Mines to Father Tompkins. Before his appointment as manager of Mount Cameron Farm, Senevex's experimental farm on the outskirts of Antigonish Town, which today, of course, is a thriving and growing subdivision. Now, the appointment of Father Gillis is very controversial, okay? He's given the job primarily to mend that rift that had developed with experts in the provincial uh, Department of Agriculture. Yet, while the relationship with Halifax is important, um, his appointment was clearly a disappointment to the labor people and a surprise to those who wanted the philosophy professor and longtime extension advocate, Father Daniel Doc Dan McCormick. Also, a lot of people considered Father Gillis to be too dull to lead the department. You know, in other words, if the movement, quote, pivoted on personalities, as one uh, reporter noted, then Father Gillis was going to have a difficult time. Now, remember, this is a theme, uh, extensions trapped by its history, and Cody has been a dynamic personality, and his two immediate successors, well, they simply didn't measure up. Now, let's see, I'll go back to that one, excuse me. By 1960, Director Gillis faces another troubling problem. And that, it might surprise you to learn, is the Cody International Institute. It's important to remember that by 1959, Pope John XXIII is calling upon Western Catholics to turn their attention to the plight of Latin America. Okay, and the Diocese of Antigonish, which has a very long history of sending missionaries overseas to China, to Japan, is eager to export extensions principles, okay, to communities and countries like the Dominican Republic. These missionaries are also eager to bring their students back to Senevex to study extensions methods. And soon, with so many students from across the globe visiting Antigonish, the economic and social problems of countries like Panama are debated with as much passion as those of Canso and Christmas Island had been decades earlier. In fact, Bishop Jannar MacDonald, Chancellor of Senevex, spoke of Latin America as, quote, the Antigonish obligation. So in the weeks before his sudden death from heart failure in December 1959, MacDonald appoints Monsignor Francis Smythe to direct a formal on-campus program to house and train foreign students in extensions methods. Naming the new institute after the late Monsignor Cody, the new organization was billed as a sort of, are you ready, extension of the extension department. But of course, it didn't take long for a dispute over jurisdiction to begin. 
Will everyone recognize the benefit of welcoming international scholars to campus? Father Gillis is deeply, deeply concerned that the Cody Institute has been hastily organized, especially without defining its role in relation to the Extension Department. Most importantly, Gillis insists that the new Cody Institute becomes a branch of a larger and better funded Extension Department. Now, this is important to keep in mind because this is really the beginning of a long and complicated relationship between the two organizations. Now, without going into too many details, while trying to make the new Cody Institute into Extension's little brother, so to speak, Father Gillis makes a number of tactical mistakes. The first thing is he clearly underestimates both the yearning for global missionary work at Santa Vex and also the desire for the institutional prestige that Cody could provide. Second, as Monsignor Smythe, one of the diocese's finest intellectuals, has been called home from a prestigious national posting in Ottawa, the priest is not interested in playing second fiddle to Father Gillis. Third, and perhaps most importantly, Cody had external funding. And in fact, they even had a large grant from Archbishop Richard Cushing in Boston to construct a new building. In other words, Monsignor Smythe held the cards, and while he agreed in the short term to become an extension of extension, he was not prepared to accept this arrangement on a long-term basis. Now, recognizing the brewing problems between extension and Cody, uh, President Hugh Summers tries a number of solutions, but they all fail. However, when William Power is announced as Antigonish's sixth bishop in May 1960 and thus Chancellor of Senevex, Father Gillis's position is, I think, severely weakened. Not only did the new bishop, a native of Montreal, want an international presence at the college, but Power did not have any previous loyalty to extension. He's not from the, he wasn't from the Antigonish Diocese. And recognizing that he lacked the support of his bishop and facing general complaints about his leadership in the summer of 1961, Father Gillis resigns. Now, he's quickly replaced, Father Gillis is quickly replaced by the young Father Joseph N. McNeil. Uh, he's the first native priest with a doctorate in canon law, uh, but in many ways he's a strange choice to lead the department. An intellectual, a brilliant organizer, his career would culminate in an appointment as Archbishop of Edmonton in 1973, and in fact he only left us a few months ago. Yeah, well, many were, were happy, or at least, uh, you know, not, you know the, the appointment is fine. Others are perplexed as to why a priest with no previous connection to extension would be placed at the helm. And the answer, of course, that he's put there to soothe relations with the Cody Institute, which officially opens in the autumn of 1961. It's not surprising, then, that McNeil immediately begins to accommodate Monsignor Smythe, the indispensable Sister Marie Michael, for example, was soon splitting her time as the librarian of both Extension and Cody. And McNeil even chairs the Diocesan Latin American Committee. Now, while harmony reigns on the Son of X campus, many friends of the Anagadish movement are extremely confused about the Cody Institute and the future of Extension. Obviously, people are pleased that the methods tested in communities like St. Joseph's and Heatherton are being applied in Latin America and India, but what plans did Extension have for the local economy? There's also a concern that Extension's moving away from its traditional program. Now, this is the first time that we encounter this, but certainly not the last. While field workers still did some very important work with credit unions and cooperatives, as organizations like the Nova Scotia Credit Union League and the Cooperative Union of Nova Scotia mature and assume autonomy within the sectors that made the Antigonish movement famous, some wondered if the department had become a victim of its own success. Now, this is very, very, very important. Remember, we all know about the famous credit unions and fishing cooperatives. But by the 1960s, okay, these organizations mostly administered themselves. In other words, central cooperative entities like the Nova Scotia Credit Union League, they did not need, nor frankly did they want, extension having any direct authority over their affairs. Think of it as a case whereby extension has birthed an organization that's now all grown up. Okay, the chicklings have left the nest. 
Now, if you're a director McNeil or a field worker, you're extremely frustrated by those who complain that the program does not mirror that of the 1930s or 40s. And facing tremendous pressure from veterans of the movement, the director struggles to explain to the community that extension was still working to make people masters of their own destiny, only with different methods. Yet the perception that the spirit and ideals of Monsignor Cody, if you will, are in jeopardy is extremely worrisome for the college. Now, extension is very visible in the community. Uh, the main office is on the Cenevex campus, as we know. But since the 1930s, there's also a field office in Sydney, and there'll be more field offices in other places. Now, the Sydney field office, though, has both practical and historic importance. The long and often acrimonious battle between labor and capital uh, in the coal fields of Cape Breton is really one of the reasons that extension is created in the first place. It's a busy office, and an office which by the late 1950s, I'm told, had some 50 volunteers. Yet by the 1960s, coal and steel are in trouble. In 1962, for example, the number 16 colliery in New Waterford, which had produced some 17 million tons of coal in its lifetime, is, is shut down. Three years later, with the area already under severe economic strain, the number 18 mine in New Victoria is also closed. Now, for extension field workers in Sydney, like Father William Roach, it's time to worry. And when, therefore, in the summer of 1967, Ottawa creates the Cape Breton Development Corporation, or, or DEVCO as it was known, to take over and operate the, 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 the coal mines, extension is a firm supporter. And incredibly, less than two weeks later, the owner of the Sydney Steel Plant announced that the, that the plant would cease production in April 1968. Black Friday, as the notice of the closure was known locally, stuns workers and absolutely caught the government, labor leaders, and extension field workers completely off guard. Now, fearing the total collapse of the entire social and economic structure of Cape Breton, within hours, Director McNeil has Father Roach working on a problem. He's working on this problem full time. Collaborating with other church groups, labor unions, and politicians, in November 1967, Extension helps rally 20,000 citizens to march in a parade of concern. And what they're demanding is provincial government intervention. And in December 1967, uh, December 1967, Halifax announces that the Sydney Steel Corporation, or Cisco as it became known, would operate the mill as a provincial crown entity for at least a year. Now, Clearly advocating for state ownership of Cape Breton's industry was certainly not part of the original message of the Antigonish movement, but times were desperate. The ghosts were lurking, but there was no other way to keep the mines and the steel mill operational. Now, as I mentioned previously, Director McNeil is a, is a bright guy. Okay, and in the summer of 1969, he's, he's plucked away and he's appointed Bishop of St. John, New Brunswick. To replace him, Senevex quickly announces the appointment of the gentle giant, the director of the Sydney office, Father George Topshi. Now Topshi is certainly next in line, if that makes if that makes sense. He's 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 you know he's clearly the most experienced. But it's important to note that he was very close friends with Monsignor Smythe over at Cody. In fact, they shared a classroom seat together in grade four. It's also clear that Smythe wants Topshi to succeed him as director of the Cody Institute. And while he's not Smythe's immediate successor, in 1973, Senevex does indeed appoint Topshi as both the director of extension and the Cody Institute. And in the rain-soaked autumn, the two offices are moved under one roof in the John R. The John R. McDonald building on the south end of campus. Now, well, there's harmony between Cody extension. Father Topshi's administration begins during turbulent times. Objecting to in loco parentis, which uh, means clergy serving in place of a parent, undergraduates demanded campus reforms and rebelled against the traditional authority of the priest professor. In 1970, the prickly issues of alcohol and freedom to entertain members of the opposite sex in the dorm rooms 
dominate campus politics. Although a tempest in the teapot, the unrest reached a violent crescendo when a gasoline firebomb is thrown through a window in, in Morrison Hall. And in response, classes are canceled, students are sent home to write exams, and the administration uh, threatens to cancel convocation. Now, as some 56 students begin a four-day hunger strike on campus, a collection of writing and speeches of Monsignor Cody is released in Canadian bookshops. And for many of the older cooperators who had devoted their lives to a program that helped fishermen, miners, and farmers earn enough money to feed their families, the question of open doors really seems a, like another world. Yet this erosion of clerical authority is not limited to the Zavarian campus. When in the midst of this student unrest, for example, Father Topshi is quoted in the provincial newspaper advocating for a merger of Nova Scotia's small municipalities, there are many who feel that the priest should stick to baptisms and funerals. Even within the pages of the local diocesan newspaper, The Casket, there are emerging debates on whether or not the priest should speak on social issues from the pulpit. So while Monsignor Cody and Monsignor McKinnon succeeded in part because of their clerical status, by the 1970s, it's not always advantageous. That's important to remember. Things are changing. Now, one thing, another thing I, I, I really want you to think about, and I want you to remember about Father Topshi, is that he's really a labor man, okay? Between 1933 and 1936, he works in the Sydney Steel Mill, okay, to save his tuition for Cenevex. And he is therefore extremely knowledgeable about the needs of working class families. Now, it's, there's no question that Fathers Topshi and others like Andrew Andy Hogan, Father Andy Hogan, who's working in the Sydney field office, they represent, um, I think, a new era in the university's relationship with labor. And it certainly demonstrates a shift leftward, if you will. While clergy intellectuals once recoiled, for example, at the radical rhetoric of Cape Breton communists like J.B. McLaughlin, one of the principal advocates of the infamous 1925 coal strike. By 1970, Father Topshi mused that, quote, God had given McLaughlin the reward of a martyr, end quote. That's a major statement. And if you compare the two eras, uh, it, that really, really uh, stands out. Now, in 1971, due to Father Topshi's personal initiative, if you will, the New Atlantic Region Labor Educational Center, or ARLIC, was established at Senevex in conjunction with the representative federations of labor, government agencies. In the wet and chilly March of 1972, 30 students, if you think about that first people's school, well, this is another similar thing, 30 students from the ranks of labor arrived on campus for an intensive two-week course. We want to extend the horizon of the labor movement beyond the bargaining table, noted one participant, to the whole field of community involvement and social action. But like his predecessor, Father Topshi struggles to explain how programs like Arlick fit the message of cooperatives and credit unions. Moreover, as the new federal regional economic programs like the Department of Regional Economic Expansion or DRE as it was known, begin to pump money into the local economy, Extension struggles to maintain its own independence. In fact, field workers become wary even of suggesting government programs as a means of financing new endeavors. The problem is obvious. People can't be masters of their own destiny while reliant on government. Government is increasingly dominating the lives of our people by making most of the decisions for them, noted a frustrated Father Topshi. And echoing Monsignor Cody's warning not to, quote, run to the government with hat in hand, the director was desperate to find some more permanent funding for his program. I am fed up with chasing government grants, he noted in 1977. The real answer is an endowment fund of several millions. Now, I think it's important to note that while extension is moving away from its traditional program, they do start to focus more intently on the poor and the marginalized. Field workers work closely with organizations like Sydney Seton Foundation to build hundreds of new homes for families throughout the colliery towns. They also ensure spaces are made available for families living on low and middle incomes. 
extension is very supportive of X Project, the student-led organization that worked both in African Nova Scotian and indigenous communities. These dedicated volunteers and tutors, then organized by the Prince Edward Island native Joan Dillon, were the vanguard for racial and new racial awareness in the region. Now you have to remember that in the early 1970s, racial tensions in the Antigonish area are widely covered in the national press. And journalists seem rightly shocked that poverty in communities like Lincolnville, Guysboro County, only 45 kilometers away from the heart of the Senevex campus, have gone unattended for generations. And violence between black and white youths and chronic unemployment and a sense that African Nova Scotians had not been part of Monsignor Cody's big picture were deeply concerning to a lot of people. I think it's also important to note that as Extension focuses on full-time work in the historic communities like Upper Big Trackety, Lincolnville, and Rear Monastery, they found many people that were suspicious of outsiders with, quote, all the answers. You see this a lot. And much like the 1930s, when field workers go into the homes of farmers and fishermen of the region, it takes considerable time and effort to build credibility with local stakeholders. When Father Gerald Rogers, a housing expert, goes into Lincolnville and Upper Big Trackety in the late 1970s, he wisely offers, quote, no promises. The answers had to come from the people themselves and from the people they came. Now, by 1978, Extension's 50th year, Father Topshi starts to feel overworked, okay? And he suggests that the university appoints someone else to administer the Cody Institute. The following spring, the quiet and unassuming former priest, Dr. Alexander A. McDonald, a graduate of Son of X and Cornell University, and the chair of the university's sociology department, he takes the helm at Cody. And Topshi remains director over at Extension. The two organizations are separate once again. Yet the 1980s brings with it a whole new set of economic problems. A serious national recession, double digit inflation, high interest rates affect everybody from construction workers to first time homeowners. Now recognizing that the local people know where the ice is thin, the department starts to form advisory committees in counties of Richmond, Inverness and, and Pictou to further grassroots participation. Yet by 1982, as Father Topshi decides to retire, he worries about the great challenges ahead. Okay, in other words, it seems to him, extension seems unable to alter the course of economic history in any way. And in fact, among some of the traditional audiences, they're losing ground. After the merger of uh, Xavier College and the Nova Scotia Institute of Technology, for example, Field workers in Sydney were told not to compete with the programs now offered by the fledgling College of Cape Breton. So indeed, at times the mandate, uh, the mandate seems to be shrinking. Now in the midst of these problems, Father Topshi retires and he's replaced by Dr. Teresa McNeil, a graduate of the Son of X class of 1957 and an extension veteran who had first worked out of the Sydney office in 1960 McNeil has a doctorate in adult education from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and returned to Son of X to chair the brand new Department of Adult Education in 1970. Now, unquestionably, the appointment of Teresa McNeil as the sixth director is a historic moment. Not only is she the first lay director, but she's also the first female to guide the movement. As I noted earlier, women like Mary Arnold and Ida Delaney uh, had made vital contributions, but but no woman had ever been at the helm. Now, perhaps it's this change of perspective, and this is important, but having surveyed her new department, Dr. McNeil makes the decision to take extension in a different direction. And the problem in her mind is that while extension considered itself a player within the economy, in reality, it did nothing of the sort. In other words, if if the purpose of extension is articulated by its celebrated uh, founders was to employ group action to create structural change within the local economy, then extension had appallingly low productivity. And moreover, while the general public might still associate extension with the fable cooperative movement, McNeil wanted people to face the fact that organizations like the United Maritime Fishermen no longer wanted their direct help. As difficult as this might have been for the friends of the Antigonish movement, 
the cooperative centrals were no longer part of the department's mandate, and it was simply time to move on. Instead, Dr. McNeil wanted her field workers to focus on adult education, research, and the development of the entire human person. Now, regardless of what you think of this decision, and it was very controversial, you have to admire her courage. Not only is she the first lay woman in control, but she's now taking Cody's movement in a radical new direction. So what changes do we see? The first McNeil brings with her to the Extension Department, the university's continuing education program. She also soon begins the training the trainers program, which brings in much needed resources. And both of these activities soon grow. They're separate from extension work, but they're soon considered part of the wider program. It's also a focus on art, on the development of youth and senior citizens. And there's also an increased focus on issues that are important to women. Through the work of field workers like Sister Michelle McDougall, by 1987, the group Women Aware, for example, meets regularly, and the newsletter Making Connections is published with a special focus on rural women residing in the Strait, uh, Strait of Canso, Guysboro area. In 1984, Extension aids the construction of a transition home for women, for battered women, which serve the mainland counties of eastern Nova Scotia. And, you know, as I always say, and as I write about this, of course, has nothing to do with credit unions and cooperatives. But it certainly did help a lot of women become masters of their own destiny. Yet as the department moves towards these new approaches, this new program, the trouble in the traditional sectors of the economy, especially in the Atlantic ground fishery, only furthered the feeling that extension was a ship without an anchor. Well, the department did what it could in sectors like the fishery. By 1988, declining stocks, poor catches, overfishing by large foreign trawlers, Force United Maritime Fishermen, that first brainchild of Monsignor Cody, it forces them out of business. The whole thing, in my view, noted one UMF official, is very much a tragedy. Now, Extension fights back through its association with the Arlick Conference. And in February 1985, a conference on the future of the organized labor movement led to the establishment of the Senevec Center for Research on the Future of Work. Based on McNeil's new direction, the center sought closer collaboration between Extension and the university faculty. Yet, although the partners quickly learned that the local economy is probably not the, the, the local community, excuse me, is probably not the best place or the most convenient laboratory for faculty research, some important material was produced. Now, in 1984, after a battle fought with his usual quiet determination. Father George Topshi dies of cancer. Shortly after, the priest's many friends organized a memorial fund to honor his memory and promote the social and economic causes that were dear to his heart. With this money, the annual George Topshi Memorial Conference was organized to discuss regional concerns among academics and community-based stakeholders. Much like the famous rural and industrial conferences of the past, the Topshi Conference provided local citizens with an opportunity to participate and respond to presentations from scholars and experts. Now, the, the inaugural conference held in August 1984 attracts 200 participants, and they gather to discuss the nature of human work from the perspective of history, sociology, theology, business, you name it. And the democratic nature of the Topshi Conference was emphasized when organizers of the, uh, the following year's conference, 1985, they decided to proceed without a formal registration process and offer free accommodation to anyone who wanted to stay on the Senevex campus. The response is overwhelming, and over 300 delegates arrive in Antigonish in 1985 to discuss the subject of power. So perhaps Extension had found its new program. But despite these successes, the great triumphs of Monsignor Cody, that live ghost, still looms large in the historical memory of eastern Nova Scotia. In 1981, a small mountain near northeast Marguerite, um, Cody's birthplace, was renamed Mount Cody by the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. Uh, the centennial celebration of his birth in July 1982 drew great, great crowds. In September of that year, the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada unveils a plaque at Xavier Hall to commemorate the founding of the Antigonish movement. So all these things are going on at the same time. Um, 
when you have when when you juxtapose these you know the the fame and the celebrated history of the past with all this bad news that we see by the early 90s in the traditional economic sectors like the fishery people start to aggressively critique director mcneil's focus on adult education and research in other words they wondered what these developments had to do with cody's message of cooperatives and credit unions where were the economic victories and so by the early 1990s many people within the university including many field workers who objected to being called uh, learning technologists for example they strongly opposed mcneil's agenda with her expertise highly sought after by other groups and recognizing i think the writing on the wall mcneil resigns she had tried to change the direction of extension but that live ghost that dan mcginnis had talked about uh, seemed to have claimed her so now determined to rekindle the past in 1993 cenovex hires the anaganish county native tom webb to succeed mcneil having served both in government and within central cooperative organizations like the moncton-based co-op atlantic webb's plan was to take extension back to its roots through cooperative management training programs the central cooperatives might not have needed extensions direct administration but they could use help training their leadership yet even with this plan the new director struggles to develop a mandate for himself and for the first time there are grumblings at son of x that the extension department had run its course searching for an identity the department held a gathering titled university in the community in 1995 to consider extensions agenda for the 21st century at the time the school invites back many old faces to campus including senator alan j mccacken and monsignor cody's contemporary sister irene doyle sociologists and historians who had studied the anagonish movement like dan mcginnis at son of x and michael welton of mount saint vincent who by that time was working on biographies of both cody and tompkins were asked to comment on the renewal process now at the conference the ongoing debate about extensions mandate rages on some like senator mccacken felt that major deviations from the original principles of monsignor cody was wrong if that happened he noted please don't call it the anagonish movement others though like michael welton argued that the ideas of the movement no matter how powerful would not fit the existing economic conditions of modern times okay or as another historian notes it's very difficult to adapt timeless principles from historic experiences and events now as director webb worked to fund his cooperative management program extension continues its work in the community there was for example a strong focus on women's issues poverty housing field workers helped organize a second stage housing project in new glasgow Cooperate, cooperated with the Transition House Association of Nova Scotia, worked with women in low-income situations, and one field, field worker even worked on a spousal homicide study that was submitted to the province in 1995. After the collapse of the Atlantic ground fishery in 1991, Extension's instrumental in organizing the Coastal Communities Network, which brings fish harvester organizations, municipalities, develop, development agencies, and church groups into active collaboration. When the traditional economic sectors began to fail, Extension was there with its initiating the development of enterprising activities project, which was known as IDEAS. And it hosted a number of fairs and venture forums to assist potential entrepreneurs invest, uh, interested in new economic opportunities. Extension also remains committed to health research and field workers collaborated with the Nova Scotia Heart and Stroke Foundation on a campaign to increase awareness about the dangers of poor diet and lack of exercise. They also support the province's strengthening community health program. And by the end of the decade, through the successful People assess, assess, Assessing Their Health Project, or known as PATH, Extension facilitated local health needs assessments, offered Saturday morning workshops, and supported community participation and decision making on health related policies. Yet, despite all of this important work, Director Webb is frustrated in his attempts to get back to the department's roots. When he finally puts together funding for a cooperative course, he's informed that the university is not interested. It is, I must say, a real point of irony. Frustrated, by 1999, the director had resigned and eventually took his idea to St. Mary's University in Halifax. Now, as we get towards the end of, of the presentation, we're at a critical juncture, okay? 
By 2000, construction is transforming the Sun of X campus. And the university takes a long, hard look at the extension department. Now with Director Webb unable to get his cooperative management program off the ground, the university seems very unsure of how extension fits into the institution's future. In fact, it looks like it has come to the end of the road. Moreover, the continuing education courses, which provided much needed monies, were moved out of extension's remit to become the new Department of Continuing and Distance Education. And not only did this strip extension of some revenue, but it greatly reduced its profile. Now, as the search for a new director goes on, the university decides that extension is now to focus primarily on economic development and exclusively in eastern Nova Scotia. Under this new mandate, some extension staff leave the department. Others are concerned about how extension might promote enterprise development without duplicating the work of other agencies like the Sun of X Enterprise Development Center, which had opened in 1997. And for Dr. Roger Werrell, who took the helm in 2001, the new mandate is extremely restricting. And more ominous, I think, immediately after tabling his first report to the university's Board of Governors, it was questioned whether or not the extension department should even continue. In fact, some of the governors noted, quote, that the world was very different now, end quote, meaning presumably that Eastern Nova Scotia no longer needed extension's assistance. Clearly, by the early 2000s, the days when the department could get by on its historical legacy and goodwill are over. 2000 to 2014 would prove to be a very, very difficult time for the extension department. In 2008, the historic Sydney field office is closed and the staff is shrunk. There are, of course, some pretty big successes. Uh, extension helps communities fight back against school closures. Uh, they do a lot of work within the Mi'kmaq community and within the environmental sector. Um, and it shows, I think, that while bruised in this period, they had not been completely broken. But encouragingly, in 2014, a new Son of X administration decides that indeed, extension does have a future. And in fact, in 2016, the current president of Son of X told a gathering of alumni that the school was, quote, recommitting to Antigonish, the Antigonish Movement 2.0. More important, this had been embedded in the university's strategic plan. So the work continues. So we've come to the end, and I know we've covered a lot of ground, and I want you to remember a few things if you, to take away tonight. First, the people who took the extension torch from Monsignor Cody, A.B. McDonald, and others faced what I think is an impossible task. Not only were they replacing a folk hero, they were charged with replicating the great successes of the 1930s in an entirely new economic environment. They were hounded by Dan McGuinness's live ghost. And as we noted, by the 1960s, the soil from which extension had harvested its bountiful crops, in other words, cooperatives and credit unions, was now under cultivation by the very organizations that the department had birthed. Organizations like the Nova Scotia Credit Union League and the United Maritime Fishermen, though they no longer needed the department's direct involvement. And remember, this is hardly a negative thing. Right? Monsignor Cody wants people to become masters of their own destiny, not forever reliant on experts from Sen of X. We also have to keep in mind that the intervention of federal and provincial governments into the regional economy uh, through development programs and crown corporations like DEVCO meant that extension was forced out of many economic sectors. To maintain funding, they're careful not to duplicate existing programs, and they're often bound by the agenda of funding agencies. The reality is that effective community economic development as well as quality education programs require resources. Extension was supposed to remain a leader in economic development with a budget that was a fraction of the millions of dollars that government had to spend in the region. Therefore, non-traditional programs, for example, like the continuing education courses, while unpleasant for those who felt that it had nothing to do with the program of Monsignor Cody, often paid the bills. And over the last 25 years, the work of the field worker has become as much about obtaining grants and contracts as it is about field work. This is not a critique, it is just merely a reality. As Father Topshi noted in 1977, the real answer is an endowment fund of several million. So in other words, if success is measured through the strict continuation of the policies of 1928 to 1952, 
then the program after 1953 had no chance to succeed. In the modern economic environment, the directors, field workers, and staff who work with stakeholders throughout the region were essentially trapped by its own history. Yet over the past two decades, three decades, families throughout eastern Nova Scotia who confronted seemingly endless economic challenges will tell you that Extension was with them providing support. Communities that have watched, for example, their economic industries collapse in the 1980s and 90s, or more recently watched their, their local schools close down, understand both the material and psychological importance of an active Extension Department. No one will write books about my field workers, Tom Webb once told me, but they did some fine community development work. The legendary Father Tompkins, certainly no believer in institutionalism, once noted that we should use our best brains to solve our worst problems. In other words, scholars and experts were not meant to glance down upon the community from their lofty spaces. Rather, they're, they're there to employ their knowledge and expertise to serve their communities. Education for education's sake is noble and important, but Father Tompkins believed that the universities had a greater and equally noble obligation to the public. So extension continues to chart its course, ghosts and all. So thank you very much, and now I'm very happy to, to have a, a, a wider discussion. Thanks for listening, folks. Peter, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much uh, for that interesting retrospect. Um, so folks, uh, this is our opportunity now to uh, engage in conversation with, uh, with Peter and with each other. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a microphone icon. One click will turn it on. One click will turn it off when you're finished. Uh, there's also a hand raised icon if you would like to raise your hand to let us know that you do have a question. And if you're a little shy on the microphone, there is a chat feature where you can also add your comments. And you will find that by clicking on the purple uh, tab that you see at the bottom right hand side. And what that will do is it, it will expand the collaborate panel. And when you do so, you'll notice that there is a chat um, button. Uh, looks like a little uh, a little thought bubble, and you can type your question there. So, do I have anyone who has any comments or questions for Dr. Ludlow? Ah, and so Maureen has uh, typed into the chat that she has gratitude. Well, thanks, Maureen. Go ahead, Anthony, if you could just one click on your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, we oh. can, thanks. Yeah, okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. That was, uh, that was great, it was very, very interesting. Um, uh, I have a bit of, a bit of uh, baggage with both uh, Extension and the Cody Institute going back to the days of, um, of Father Topshi and Dr. McDonald, Alex, Angus McDonald, and all that. So um, I look forward to reading uh, reading the book. Um, so let me just uh, flag a few things as you're going through it, uh, and it brought back a lot of memories, and I recognized more people in those photographs than I should have, to be honest. Um, but uh, just a, a few uh, things that I'm just curious about whether you capture them in the book or, or not. Just um, So one of them is um, uh, there's some sectors of work that you didn't mention. So I'm just wondering if, they, if they've been lost to history or whether they're there. So um, there was certainly some work with um, Indigenous communities back in the 1960s. Um, there was both field work and that. And my, uh, the, I've heard, I've never, I haven't read any historical documentation on it around um, uh, the role that played in terms of the uh, the development of the um, of the uh, of the leadership uh, that became the I can't remember what was it called at the time but anyhow the original Nova Scotia Federation of, uh, of of Indians or whatever it was called or the Brotherhood I can't recall that as uh, any so there was some extension work there there was a, a fair amount of work done in the forestry sector as well uh, leading to um, uh, the organization of um, of the woodlot owners. Um, uh, uh, so that um, uh, there was a, a fair 
bit in that sector. In the 19, I guess it was, uh, I don't know, the late 80s, early 90s, um, there was a, a, because as we were stumbling about trying to find the, uh, 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 the the nexus between uh, cooperatives and enterprise development. Um, there was a fair amount of work done in the area of promotion of uh, of workers cooperatives uh, as well, and that led to uh, a group that still exists. I can't remember what it's called now, but it was something like the, the the community development cooperative. But it was a in partnership with the co-op sector and and others. Um, uh, and then one last little point, I mean, you're, um, which is about the ongoing relationships between extension and the established co-op sectors. So um, the only nuance I'd want to add to that is that with, certainly there was, um, uh, the, the, uh, until Tom Webb arrived on the scene, um, extension never saw itself as a cooperative, um, a cooperative uh, management uh, type of institution. Um, and early, and, and what we had tried in the earlier days was to see whether the the, the school of management at at X um, would would be interested in developing that as a as a as a thing because they were the they were the professional managers we certainly weren't uh, but there was no um, there was no real interest expressed from their side and and we let it drop for 15 years until until Tom arrived on the scene but um, but so what we ended up in the situation was. Um, uh, I don't think extension uh, had any ambitions in terms of the, the larger management issues. So trying to negotiate that space with the co-op and credit union sectors tended to be around how did these organizations or how do these enterprises carry forward their social mission? Right? And so it wasn't so much the enterprise side of it, but if you see a co-op or a credit union somehow being community based or a mix between the social community and the business, uh, we saw our side as being really on the community um, uh, social side of that. And that led to a whole bunch of work, either around um, member education, which would tend to be the fallback. And of course, the co-op sector, people saw that largely as uh, as promotion or how do you make people more loyal members or so they sh they shop more, they, they save more at the credit union or the co-op. We saw it as a little broader in terms of the social mission of the cooperative and what should it be doing more and a fair amount of work through the 80s and into the 90s around cooperative social responsibility and uh, social auditing and social reporting and that type of work which some of it moved ahead and some of it uh, kind of uh, evaporated but uh, uh, anyhow that, but uh, but in some ways I think was um, we had a, of course we had a much stronger relationship with the the boards of the cooperative federations and the corporate than we did with the management of course the managers at that time had been pretty much corporatized, if I can use that word. Um, and so therefore, they were very suspicious of, of, uh, of, of extension. That said, they recognized that they didn't have organizing skills. And I can think of at least two examples uh, uh, where they approached us at extension and asked us to go out and help organize. They got a request from the community. Could you organize a new consumer co-op in Petit de Gras? And, uh, and I remember going out there with others and also um, uh, credit union. We actually organized, I think it was the latest uh, credit union of um, uh, the last one, new or one organized in Nova Scotia, which was out on the Parsboro shore sometime in the, in the, in the late eighties. Uh, and the last piece, which I just throw in again into the mix is um, uh, the work that we did around housing cooperatives uh, for many years, as that emerged as a, as a broader thing of government policy in the 1960s and 70s, extension really became the, the driver, the lead for housing cooperatives in all of Eastern Nova Scotia. And, and that kept a number of staff employed and very much engaged in communities for 15 years or more. All right, so just throwing that out there, yeah. A mud against the the wall if any of it sticks go for it if you have any questions or whatever but, yeah. yeah no thanks thanks for that i mean you're ab you're absolutely right in terms of there being a lot more in the book you know you try to break everything down for for an mm -hmm. hour's talk but you're right i mean you think of the, the work in the indigenous communities the late 1950s early 1960s um there's some there's some work um and then like you talked about i think it's called the union i think it's called the union of nova scotia indians i think maybe that's what it was yeah. Yeah. yeah and so what i found fascinating about that so they're working in member two they're working in escazoni not not to go back a little bit 
one of the things I've been looking at for, and another line of, 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 of work related to the Catholic Church is its involvement and centralization of the Mi'kmaq in 1941. And they're very wary of getting involved. For, for, you know, it, it turns out that, that they were right to be so. Um, and what you see from Ottawa is they really want extension involved in this process. They, 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 this idea, well, we'll put everybody in Escazone, or we'll put everybody in Escazone, and we'll make it a cooperative village, if you will. Um, and Ottawa is always frustrated uh, with the extension department that they don't have more movement on that score, that they're not more involved. So, so they're 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 kind of involved in the 1950s and 60s, but then you have this idea when the when the Union of Nova Scotia Indians is organized that now we step back, and and you have Director McNeil saying, you know, that's what we do. You know, w if they invite us in, we'll go in. And there's this kind of this kind of layoff, I guess you you could think of it in that way, until like the the late 1990s, really, when extension starts to get to get more involved. But you're right, by the way, in everything you talk about, a lot of that is in the book. Uh, Extension's got its tentacles everywhere. Um, they're involved in, you know, helping helping to bring a, a pulp mill to Port Hawkesbury uh, to offset some of the environmental problems that are created by rapid industrialization, industrialization of the straight area. You talked about housing, you talked about the forestry sectors. So you're absolutely right. And you know, when you talk too about this idea of the relationship with cooperatives, it's interesting because I do find that when, when Tom Webb takes over, there is this wider discussion from extension about what is the role of, of say a consumer cooperative and the complaints that they're acting like Sobeys, you know, or they're acting like a big chain, uh, a cooperative store. Um, so it is it, it is very interesting and, and a lot more of that is is sort of further developed in the book uh yeah if i could just one uh, last final mark because you mentioned something in passing as well you mentioned uh, uh, the connection to the catholic church uh, most obviously uh yeah. through the 1980s maybe it goes on now and i'm just paying less attention but through the 1980s there were a series of um encyclicals by the um, by the bishops on issues of social justice, right, economic right, reform right. and this, and sometimes yeah. the Atlantic, some of the maritime, sorry, I think it was the Maritime Council of so, yeah, Catholic Bishops, Council sometimes bishops, they yeah. were national and sometimes they were papal or global. And um, and that was often a, um, a I, I don't know how it was funded, but I know I got trotted out more times than, than my, uh, my faith deserved. To, uh, to facilitate um, uh, conversations at parish and diocesan level right. where it was extension field staff who were leading those conversations largely around the, so what does this mean in practice type of thing yep. around, this is what's coming down from the bishops or the church, what does this mean in practice for how we engage in our community, so yeah. yeah you're, you're absolutely right. One of the things that surprised me writing this book was how how long the connection between the Diocese of Antigonish and Extension went on. I just kind of thought it petered away, but it goes right on up until Dr. David Lawless is is president of the university. And you're right, the, the term the term social justice, which is kind of ubiquitous today, is really introduced into the Extension lexicon in the early 1980s when the Atlantic Council of Catholic Bishops does indeed start to talk about some of these social issues. And it shows you how intertwined and again I was very surprised but that's coming from a more of a secular mindset uh, or a secular environment that we live in that that they were so intertwined in those days but it's it's another another very important part of the story of course when Dr. Lawless tries to make essentially make the university a little bit more Catholic there's pushback from that and then it seems like after Lawless the diocese and extension are kind of separated um, in the in the for the long term. So Peter, uh, Gord has a uh, comment in the chat and for the purpose of the recording, I'm going to read it for folks. Okay. Um, he says, I'm not shy of the microphone, but I'm in my crowded and all of a sudden noisy kitchen. So I'll chat my comment and question. Wonderful presentation, thoroughly enjoyed it. Following up on Anthony's point, I recall a fair bit of work led by John Kearney in the late 1990s, early 2000s in the area of community-based resource management or CBRM. What was most interesting about this work was that this work brought Extension and Cody together. This work ranged from organizing community-based management of ground fish quota in the Bay of Fundy to supporting coastal zone management in the Philippines. For a period, John Kearney and Pauline McIntosh, along with Jen Grant and Maria Rikia, taught a course in uh, CBRM. It was rather fishery centered centric, but it was ahead of its time in breaking down north-south boundaries. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, and that sums it up very well. And that's a big part of the part of the book as well. And it talks about that era and the work that was being done uh, in the Bay of Fundy. And they even had come up with, uh, you know, they in extension style, they had, you know, uh, talked and worked very closely with local fishermen. Um, you know, talked about where the, the 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 fish were, and 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 the 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 lay of the land or the lay of, the lay of the ocean, if you will, and came up with uh, with a with a publication um, that was a, that 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 helped fishermen navigate those waters. So yeah, they were very very active, and that is a that is another part of the part of the publication. And Peter John B asks, when will the book be available? Well, we were hoping to have it out by the end of December, but we're we're pushed back a little bit. So I would say I would say by the end of January, first first couple of weeks of February, if I had to if I had to guess, but very soon. In terms of publishing, that's that's very quick. And Maureen Cody has asked, "What is your sense of the inspiration of the Anagadish movement today?" Well, I think that it's still very powerful. I mean, there's no question, at least among the older generations, and, and that it's still ingrained in our psyche. I think there's enough people, though I am surprised when I go to conferences or academic uh, events and people don't know who M Monsignor Cody was. Um, but what I think people are recognizing is that the need for this program has not changed. That's a fascinating thing. If you go director to director to director, if you start in the 1920s and you go to the 1990s or the, into the 2000s, everybody's talking about the same issues. It's one of the, the, the great sadnesses about our region and our economy that we essentially have the same, we have problems about migration, we have credit, we have, we have credit problems, we have, we have, we have a, lot of the, a lot of the similar issues, um, problems in the rural areas, how do you keep your schools, um, so I think it's vitally important. What I think we do need, though, is 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 to continue to talk about, especially its history. Um, I think a, a lot of the history has been lost. There's a lot of players that people don't know about, and and part of that problem is the 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 intense focus we have on Cody and Tompkins, who were both wonderful, important characters. But there are so many other people that had a that that played their role. People like George Boyle. I I, I often say nobody's ever heard of George Boyle. He wrote four books. When he died in the 1950s, his um, he, he died quite young. He had health issues. He edited the Extension Bulletin, the Casket, and Bishop uh, 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 Patrick Bray, who was from St. Andrews, just out of outside of Anaganish, wrote a long letter to the paper saying, you know, he's the intellectual mind behind the movement, and, and people haven't heard of him. So I think if we widen the scope of our education and keep in mind that we need we need Extension more than ever, I think you know I think it can play it can play a, a major role. In our communities, but if you drive around eastern Nova Scotia, we get outside of Antigonish and look around. Look, we need help today. We need ideas, you know. And Maureen has also added, we we still orient our students in the Masters of Adult Education program, which began by Theresa McNeil in 1974, to the Antigonish movement then and now, and we get them to think about this. In reality, conditions have not changed that much. Still grayed out migration, resource challenges, et cetera. Many of the same issues in different forms. Yes, we need ideas. Gord helps us with this. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, you think about it, it's um, even on a, there's something that even talk about something like civil society, you know, it's kind of coming back in vogue. This idea, I think there was somebody was saying that in like the 18, I read a paper in the 1880s in, in London, England, something like 70% of people were involved in some sort of uh, uh, program outside of the home, whether they volunteered or it was a, a church group or, or something, uh, something or other and today it's like 13 percent or something like that something very very low and and i think that's all part and parcel of the modern age that we live in but the problems are still there we're disconnected we're on our phones um but but no i agree we need that leadership more maybe more than ever So folks, as uh, and Maureen just wrote, thank you for doing the heavy lifting to remind us of the history in such detailed fashion. Again, gratitude for keeping this in our thoughts. 
Well, thanks. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, this webinar has been great. Like I say, it's the first time I've ever done one. Sorry, the English movement. This is the third thing I've been able to participate now from writing this book and being part. You know, it's one thing to write about the Anaganish movement; it's another thing to be a part of it. So it's, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Well, for me, I'm very glad that uh, we do have the opportunity to do our um, our Cody Connects webinars. And for folks who are on our webinar this evening, all of our recordings from webinars, this is our number 14 this year, uh, they will be posted to the U uh, YouTube channel, the Cody International Institute's YouTube channel, to be uh, disseminated publicly. And Gord says, um, I see glimpses of the Antigonish movement today in places like St. Andrews, where the community built its own curling rink, community center, and seniors housing. Also in the local food movement, the group that rallied to bring Syrian families, the Antigonish, and the new affordable housing uh, in Antigonish. Thanks so much, Peter. Can I say something quick about St. Andrews because it's the community that I grew up in and I, it, it, it is actually a very interesting community and an interesting mix of peoples. One of the things I've always found fascinating about St. Andrews too is a lot of the leadership comes from the Dutch community that's there. And who are the Dutch community? These are people that come to Nova Scotia after the Second World War through a diocesan resettlement scheme, if you will. But they are, are, are products of this kind of vision. Right. There's a the farms are being abandoned. We need people to get back in here to reinvigorate the agricultural areas. The Dutch come and do that. And a, lo a lot of that attitude has remained in communities like that. So he, he goes right. It's, it's right in front of us. You know, we just have to look for it. Now, Dorothy, I noticed that your mic flipped on there for a moment. Uh, did you want to turn your mic back on and ask a question or make a comment? Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Go ahead. Just turn your mic back on. Oh, your mic might be off again, Dorothy. If you could just, uh, there you go. Go ahead. No. I uh, am older. I'm, I'm Peter's mom. And uh, I, as a child, would not have survived without the Anarchist movement. Uh, they gave us um, everything that we needed. And I believe that growing up in St. Andrews for my son uh, was a good experience. And the Scots and the Dutch do very well together. They <laughs> build an incredible community. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they did. And, you know, Heatherton, my mother there, who's, who's not, not feeling well, as you can hear, grew up yes, I, I had the floor. Which was another community that uh, that really embraced the Anaganish movement. Hugh John McDonald was the priest out there. Uh, eventually, the Marthas put a convent out there, and so like you could go, you could go parish to parish, really, and 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 find these success stories. It's fascinating it, to, to take the Anaganish movement on a local level. is very very interesting. <laughs> yep. All right. As we're wrapping up, is there any other final comments or questions? Well, it's been great. It's been wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Oh, it's been fantastic. And folks, um, those of you who are still in our system, um, I uh, invite you to take a peek at the chat. You'll notice that there is a a web link there. That is our webinar evaluation series. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that we are offering webinars that are of interest to our audience and we also collect feedback on what types of webinars we should do. So it's an anonymous uh, survey. If you click once on the uh, on the link, it will take you out there and it will take you about a minute and a half to complete. So just some final comments. Uh, Maureen said, aha, I knew you must be from the area. I lived in the Netherlands for 10 years and I see they are as you they and I see they are, as you say, products of this kind of thinking. I think the Antigonish movement has new forms based on the same principles. And so we have to consider how the principles are being operationalized in new forms, not old. Gord says, like Maureen, very grateful and I can't wait for the book. And Anthony said, that was great. Thanks. Look forward to reading the book. 
and I too look forward to the book. Yeah, <laughs> I me assume, too. That, I assume <laughs> Peter, that the the center image in the screen with the uh, with the, the dandelion cover. is our the anticipated cover. That's the cover. Yeah. We're very Fantastic. Happy. Yeah. Yeah. We'll know what we're looking for on the shelves. Yes, indeed. Well, folks, I appreciate your attendance this evening. It's been an absolutely enlightening evening for me, and I'm sure for our listening audience, uh, both live and into the future, when we get post this recording posted to the Cody International Institute's webinar, um, webinar channel on the YouTube site.